I really do love that they point out this film makes for 50. Tangled is so steeped in Disney lore that even if you prefer a recent film, none of them are as suitable for this milestone as this one. This is the story of how I died. Well, don't worry, this is actually a very fun story. The opening narration is a big positive right off the bat. It establishes the tone perfectly. You can tell the filmmakers aren't embarrassed to be making an unironic, genuinely fun Disney fairy tale, and that helps so much. The prologue is easily one of the best parts. It's such an involving setup, and arguably better the original tale. If anyone ever says old-fashioned fairy tales are dead, just point to this to prove them wrong. Aww. Disney has always done adorable babies well, but just look at her and tell me your heart doesn't melt. That gothel claims to be Rapunzel's burnt mother, since she gains the life from being manipulative, makes her that much more psychologically scary. The concept of the floating lanterns is another great one. It just feels so right that I completely forgot it wasn't in the original fairy tale. This pot has a pattern of a flower here. Guess what it's missing later? About the title change. The argument of young males not wanting to see a film with a girly title has some truth, but I don't have to like the tradition of renaming a fairy tale's title to a disyllabic adjective this film kickstarted one bit. Polish and wax, do laundry and mop and shine up. Sweep again and by then it's like 7 the songs are largely catchy rather than exceptional, but this one is great for kickstarting the film with lively energy and establishing the film's complete lack of cynicism. Also, the humour. Tangled relies not on wink wink gags or the lowbrow tedium common in children's cinema. It's funny simply for being funny, without being silly, clever, or sarcastic. A genuinely guileless comedy? Glorious. Eight guards, and yet not one of them is actually watching The Crown. Ugh, hay fever? Yeah. This is what I mean. The film has a breeze of contemporary humour, but not in a snarky way. It's just funny. No caveats attached. <laughs> the score really works, combining medieval motifs with expected techniques. Alan Menken rarely gets credit for his scores the way he does for his songs, so I'm acknowledging him now. So does Rapunzel's hair need brushing to turn Gahl Yun? The magic is mostly consistent, but isn't always on the mark. Actually, what if one in Berg? Why did you heard okay. Wait, didn't Rapunzel say she was finally gonna do it? Doesn't quite match up, folks, does it? Mother knows best. Here we have the film's best number. It accentuates Gothel's hammy performance as she dances with lyricism in true Broadway fashion. How did Rapunzel's hair switch to hanging out the window? I love how their reactions are the same as their illustrations on the poster. Disney Animation has made many great horses, and here's another. The comedy that results from his job dedication is priceless. The character animation is stronger than usual in CG features. It's one of many facets of Disney's cell animation that transitions effectively. Maximus is definitely able to smell him out through there. He fell flint scent a further distance earlier. So in all of 18 years, no one has stumbled upon the tower? No one? It isn't even that far from the kingdom. The saucepan's end is facing away from the mirror. Guess which way it's facing next shot? I've got a person in my closet! She seems pretty ecstatic about it, but the delivery suggests it's for other reasons I'd rather not think about. The delivery just misses the mark. Ha! Love it. You are not leaving this tower! Ever! This would be a good time to realise you're being manipulated. Almost three days time. How old must she have looked after being away for three days? Definitely old enough that Rapunzel would have noticed. But may I just say... Hi. The banter between the two does sometimes make them just that bit blander. It's in that pot, isn't it? Really, the humour works wonders. Even if that were the only thing it had going for it, the film would still be memorable. Flynn goes from lying on his side to lying on his back. And when I promise something, I never, ever break that promise. 
That's clearly meant to be her telling the truth. So where does this fit in with breaking her promise to Gahl? It'd be fine if it weren't for her verbal tone. All the development in Rake and Rapunzel's hair move not realistically, but to explore character and emotion. Like the best Disney Cell animation was so worth it. The characters and journey are simple, but the film sells it so well. The first time ever, I'm completely free. Honestly, the reprise of her yearning song is weaker than the main version. It's mostly a standard example of the genre. The first time I saw this, I waited for the inevitable punchline. It didn't come, and I was so relieved. The filmmakers are showing that the Disney tradition is none to be ashamed of for even a second. You've got to love them for that. This is so fun! I am a horrible daughter. I'm going back. I am never going back! <laughs> I am a despicable human being. Her swings between elatation and guilt is easily one of the film's funniest things. Enough for me to single them out. Crush her soul? Like a grape. That's a tomato. The joke's weak if it's not also a grape. That thumper lookalike is so cute. Why are we not getting a close-up? It'd make the joke funnier alongside being adorable. How did Rapunzel not know about the secret entrance? Gothel would have had to use it when she was young and her hair wasn't long. All the curtains are closed here, yet they were open when Rapunzel left. On the one hand, this sequence demonstrates the artist's skill at lighting Gothel in varying shades as the scene requires. But given her control of Rapunzel is based solely on lies, her credibility as a threat starts diminishing now, despite being psychologically scary. This is a great example of how they sought to give the background not just the texture of oil paintings, but the depth too. Just look at the way the pub is portrayed. You wouldn't think you could do that with CG, but there it is. Is it blood in your moustache? We can see later his moustache is blood free. This film shows blood, so it's not like it couldn't have here. That poster's text is different from the one earlier. How come the others don't state what the reward is? But despite my evil look and my temper and my hood. I'm rather mixed on this number. On the one hand, it's the one song that's completely unexpected, given all the others fit neatly into established categories. Being surprised is good. But it also just doesn't work. It feels like it should be the film's best song, all wacky and delightful. But it just isn't, and I can't pinpoint why. Well, that must be a magic piano. How else to explain a pain perfectly after having its keys knocked out? Must be a friend of Alan's magic carpet. Gee, isn't it a coincidence that Gothel happens upon them straight away? But I still like this sequence for all the face sight gags involving the burly men. Hey, I said I was torn on it. Obviously the filmmakers play around with how much hair she has, but there's no way it's little enough to hold all of it in her hands. The action adventure parts aren't quite up to the standards of the comedy, but given we've established the comedy works really well, not hitting that threshold still leaves plenty of room to be more than fine. If the hair was shorter before, it's really short now. Wanna guess what the body count is from this flood? Hint, it rhymes with zero. Oh wait, that's the answer? Wish real life was that lucky. The filmmakers make sure we see they reclaim the saucepan, yet it's never pivotal again. There's a plant without a payoff. I have magic hair that glows when I sing. Bit late to the party, Rapunzel. Kind of the point, of course, but still. Rapunzel needed to finish the song previously for the hair to glow. Not so here. Also, her hair didn't have a delay before starting to glow. Dramatic effect is as dramatic effect does, folks. This is so gorgeous and patiently and breathtaking. It may combine nearly all the things difficult to do in CG, but it's so worth it. Why is he smiling at me? I could think of a few reasons. Nah, but in all seriousness, Pascal is as appealing as any toy-ready animal psychic has ever been. Even if her credibility is dropped, she's still so manipulative. The filmmakers clearly love classic Disney villains as much as us. How come that one hair strand is short but the rest are not? Are we to believe gal has been cutting just that one all these years? The trade-off to being so jolly and fun is that the film's lacking in thematic depth or psychological insight. Thus, the passages that are meant to be sincere and meaningful aren't especially. I like Eugene Fitzherbert much better than Flynn Rider. Then you'd be the first. Kind of a redundant statement to make. He said, someone might as well know, earlier, implying no one else knows Bodo's identities. Pascal hiding here is pointless. There's no way Gothel didn't see him. Her hair's getting really grey there. Now would be a good time to notice Rapunzel and connect the dots. Mother, 
what a number, the reprise. It combines bombastic broadwayness with dramatic lighting that casts her in glaring foul shades. Another thing the artists did to hark back to Disney's cell animation was giving the characters a glow. They internally illuminated them to fit with the painterly nuance of the film's look and heritage. The dripping water makes for a funny gag, but there's no way it wouldn't have dried away by now. I dig how Pascal turns red at a moment of shock on instinct. This is what I do when the teacher's back is turned after they've paired me on a project with someone I can't stand. Or it would be if there was someone I couldn't stand. The way the film's visuals keep in Disney traditions while making them contemporary is magnificent when you consider it mixes realism and crazy otherworldly sights on the level of Sleeping Beauty. So after fields, a pub, a tunnel, a dam, a cave, and a forest, it takes a village square to tangle our hair up. I'm pretty sure that's not how it works. Another thing it pulls from the Disney past is playing around with the styles of the minor humans. I can't be the only one getting Studio Ghibli vibes from these girls. It's great how this whole sequence uses folk music to drive its energy, rather than defaulting to a musical number, or worse, a pop song. None of that got on her dress, and no, it didn't just blend in. What if it's not everything I dreamed it would be? It will be. And what if it is? Well, that's the good part, I guess. You get to go find a new dream. Just because it lacks thematic depth doesn't mean it can't be insightful. Here's an ethos we should all carry. The parents never speak, but they don't need to. Just look at the emotion in their faces and small gestures. Animation itself can be so moving. For all that I've been praising the film's incorporation of aesthetic Disney traditions, it justifies being CG. The lighting of the paper lanterns is something that couldn't really be done in cell animation this well. All those days watching from the windows All those years outside the The love ballad is another I'm torn on. It's appropriately soaring and moving, but it's by far the film's most anonymous song. If there's enough wind to move the lanterns, it would stir all these ships in full sail. Furthermore, it's impractical to remain in full sail when anchored. Um, Flynn definitely didn't have them anywhere on the boat when they left the harbour. Same goes for the satchel. This isn't a Looney Tune short, the rules of hammer space don't apply. I hope I don't need to explain why this is so beautiful. It speaks for itself. Just be glad Tangle's given us one of the most singularly beautiful passages in animation, CG or otherwise. The film's tone is held up superbly, but the third act makes a dive towards pronounced horror that it hasn't built up to at all. If Gahl told them what Rapunzel's hair could do, what had she said she wanted? They'd be suspicious otherwise. We're missing information here. The scene plays out like they didn't meet back in the forest. No, I really mean that. On my first viewing, this made me think the forest scene was a deleted scene that got left in for a moment. Also, her hair isn't as grey as it should be, giving us deterioration before. The glaring green and foul white here, it's so striking folks. That guard looks kind of regretful about hiding Flynn. Disney has benefited from the Pixar merger by taking on that studio's attention to detail for repeat viewings. Not that Disney didn't do that already, but Pixar excels at it. Removing the flowers wouldn't be enough to straighten her hair. It was braided, after all. If it finds even the slightest ray of sunshine, it destroys it. By the third act, Gotham might as well be any cringing, craven bad guy. It's always disappointing when a villain gets less interesting as we reach the end. So Rapunzel has been subliminally painting the sun pattern all these years and seen it after the festival unlocks her memories? That's actually pretty neat. The relationship echoes the one between Quasimodo and Frollo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame too much by now. It's a common trope in old tales, of course, but the execution is too similar for my liking here. Rapunzel hadn't moved any further than the stairs, yet her hair isn't draping down it like it was previously. The climax was getting too serious and bland, so I'm glad they brought back all these guys. They are very entertaining. At no point did the others break Flynn's shackles, they just vanish. No way the kingdom has that many guards. No blooming way. That still would have hurt in a way you can't imagine if you're not male. Also, while it was nice of Maximus to bring them to save Flynn, he could have easily caught up to Gothel and Rapunzel before they reached the tower instead. I feel maybe this whole time we've just been misunderstanding one another and we're really just... Yeah, you're right, we should go. Just what the doctor ordered, I really dig that joke. Playful without overly winking at the audience. How did she bind Rapunzel? No, seriously, how? Gahal didn't seem to be especially stronger earlier. 
Assuming that the knife was bloodless to remain family friendly, how come they can show a bloody wound? Is there a distinction between the two? I'm not seeing it. I get that Flynn was saving Rapunzel nobly, thus completing his arc, but he could have done that as soon as she healed him. Just saying. And it all comes to a head. Gothel's final scene is as pasted and routine as any Disney villains has ever been. Despite her hands withering earlier, they look younger as she falls. Unless Flynn is faking his near-death experience, he shouldn't have been able to flip his palm back onto his body. No and behold, now it's back on the floor. It was his other hand he was stroking Rapunzel's face with. Again, the parents have such touching moments due to their facial animation. Rather than hug straight away, there are a few moments of shock and disbelief, and that goes a long way. Dreams came true all over the place. That guy went on to become the most famous concert pianist in the world. And this guy, well, he eventually found true love. I really dig that we get happy endings for these guys. Helps make them as memorable as they can be for their limited screen time. They're like the seven dwarfs for a new generation. This guy is rather divisive. A decent amount of people find him off-putting. Me? I quite like him. Suits the goofy tone of the thugs. I love that we get a map of the kingdom and surrounding areas. It reminds me of similar features in the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Glorious stuff. She's a girl with the best intentions. Unlike the Disney Renaissance films, the crowd song isn't a cover of the song in the film, just your typical unrelated song and all the blander for it. The film's not perfect, let's be clear. The script is inconsistent, the villain gets muted as it progresses, the sounds are good rather than earworms, and there's little thematic depth. Just enough to hold it back. But many Disney films are guilty of these traits, and Tangled succeeds in many other areas, making for a gleeful entertainment that is legitimately great. Not a masterpiece, but easily a film Disney should be proud of. And that doesn't matter when it's this artistically groundbreaking, all the work to capturing the essence of the classic Disney films paid off, leaving the film overtly familiar, yet also looking like no other film in history. Even now, it's still Disney's best CG achievement, a proud successor to the groundbreaking Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs if ever I saw one. Minus 20. With this film, at least, Disney animation is alive and well. <laughs>